Sempre é possível ser melhor no tratamento oncológico. Mais que um desafio pessoal, essa é a nossa realidade. Uma perspectiva revolucionária para a ciência, para os médicos e para os pacientes. Reframe Oncology. Revolucionar o futuro é nossa essência. Bom dia, amigos do tratamento dos tumores ósseos é, e dos Good tumores morning, de sarcomas e partes moles. Eu gostaria de morning, dar as boas-vindas a sarcoma todos. People, the sarcoma friends, the soft tissue sarcomas. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here for this webinar. We're going to have very interesting presentations today. I'd like to thank the sponsorship, the support of the Brazilian Association of Orthopedic Oncology, Chisanku, Baumer, and uh, Intratest that are giving the support for the realization of these webinars and which are so important to our community. I'd like to thank Acontece, which is the company that is helping us to organize with an excellent work, organize these events. They're giving us a fantastic service. And thank you so much, Becker, who is the organizer of this whole event. I'd like to thank our speakers, Dr. Armando, Dr. Eduardo Ortiz, Dr. Javier Broto. It's such a pleasure to have you here participating with us of this webinar. So then we can together follow the advances, the experiences, the knowledge that you all have. So I wish you all a, a great event. And now the floor is yours, Ricardo Becker. Thank you so much. Let's all have a great event. Good day to all of us. Good morning, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Edgar, for the opening, for the introduction. The activity of today, it's going to be three uh, presentations. We're going to have three presentations of uh, 25 minutes with some uh, minutes questions. The chat is open for everybody for questions. So we're going to answer those questions. If you have, you can write the chat. Some important thing here is we're going to have simultaneous translation, English, Portuguese, Portuguese, English. And I'd like to think to say, that it's going to be, uh, this is going uh, to be transmitted by Orto TV and it's going to be recorded so um, that you can hear and watch this after the activity. Dr. Armando de Abreu is, he's the chief of the radiology of Mãe de Deus Hospital. He is responsible for hundreds of uh, radiologists here in Brazil. He's a specialist. A doctor in radiology, especially in orthopedic oncology. He's together with us in Porto Alegre here, together in all the activities um, of uh, oncology, orthopedic oncology. We're going to be talking about the radiological aspect for uh, tenosynovial giant cells tumor. Dr. Armando, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Becker. It's a pleasure to be here sharing the knowledge, you know, that I have with you. I have a short presentation about the diagnosis by image of uh, TGCT, you know, tenosynovial uh, Let me see how I can move the screen. Right there. I'm going to be talking about soft parts tumors that grows in synovial. It's benign, it's synovial proliferation within the, the tendons, more frequent in the fingers. We have many methods for evaluation. It can be through US 
can be a CT scan, it can be MSR, you know, magnetic resonance, because this is important because you can see the exact position, location of the tumor, the size and the relations that it has with the structures next to it. But other methods are of great value too. Here we have an image showing uh, nodulation, uh, nod nodules of the soft tissues. And we have here some signals, heterogeneous signals. We're going to be talking, of course, about the clinical aspects, age 30 to 50 years. Uh, it's a little bit more for female than male, no pain, uh, mass, there is recurrence. Uh, it can be malign, but it's more benign. The classification is with the relation of the location. And it has also something to do with the growth uh, pattern. These uh, lesions can be next to the joint, next to the tendons, uh, sheets. Uh, it can be intra-articular or extra-articular. And in regards to the growth pattern, it, it can be localized or diffuse. The localized uh, pattern or form, 85% happens in the fingers, in the hand fingers. We see here some nodulation. You can see in the flexor tendon. It can be located in the external part of the tendon, but it can be located in the internal part of the tendon too. The localized uh, pattern or shape, it can be found in some other big joints, especially wrist, ankle, knees, sometimes hips or even elbows and feet. The, it, there's a, a low a signal of mass with a little bit of erosion there, as you can observe in the image. Another example of an expensive mass next to the tendo uh, sheet, and you can see a very homogeneous signal. So we have a homogeneous and heterogeneous signs or signals, and in the joints, the localized form can be presented together or next to the joints with some bone erosions. And it can vary of size. Sometimes it's hard to see through the image to see if it's really a localized form or if it's a little bit more diffuse. Here, we can see some impression on the uh, superior margin. You see the expansive mass of soft tissues there so it's in the joint of the ankle there. And you see a very homogeneous sign there, heterogeneous. After that, the signal sign there, I mean, the signal, heterogeneous signal, it's a very important, very typical example of uh, TGC tumors. We can see that. The diffuse shape, though, can... Uh, can damage small or large joints too. The diffuse form or diffuse uh, shape has a little bit of bleeding. And this bleeding, uh, it, there's some hemosiderine, hemosiderine that uh, is being shown in all the sequences. Here we have a more diffuse um, sequence here, small nodes, uh, per peripheral nodes, and then we have that happening. We have some uh, villonodular, pigmented villonodular synovite. synovite. Um, there is a, the World Health Organization says that we shouldn't use that expression anymore. They recommend that we don't use synovite villonodular pigmentada, you know, the pigmented villonodular or villanodular synovitis, we are, you know, old school, and then we still sometimes keep keep using that terminology. <clears throat> well, the ex the radiology shows some bone erosions, especially peripheral ones, sometimes centered two together next to that expansive mass. 
in that the resonance shows with uh, erosions, with pressures and so on. So in the X-ray, as we know, the lesions, the injuries is next to the, the fingers, 85%. We have some soft parts, nodulation, some uh, cortical erosions. It can be, uh, in, it can invade some intrabone too, which is not so common. Periosteal reactions, which is also not common. Calcifications can happen. Calcifications can happen too. We have some radiography images of the proximal uh, finger. We see some bone erosions happening there and see I show some hip x-ray in which we can observe multiple <clears throat> bone erosions. Here we have another example of a central or centered erosions. When I use radiography, I mean x-rays before, we could see contrast in the, in the joint and we see some defects too, some filling defects within the cavity that correspond to the erosion. We see some characteristics of this many erosions, you know, subcortical erosions in the acetabulous and going, extending to the, uh, the, the extremities. And so we can see in the X-ray, there is some irregularities in, in controlling that because of course there are some filling uh, defects showing the nodular formations. This is a nice uh, case of Dr. Alexandre that there was some erosions and the CT scan showed the intra bone erosions. See, you see the femur head there. And then in the resonance showed that was a very expensive um, injury. We have now a bone erosion and soft parts problems too. What do we expect from the MRS? I mean, the resonance, the magnetic resonance will show us an image that it's good and it shows some uh, intermediate signal. They, it's probably T1, you know, low or intermediate signal in T1, high or intermediate in T2, and there's some heterogeneal after the infusion in the contracts. The heterogeneity of that is because of the fiber tissue and sometimes the hemosiderin, which is deposited within the injury. And of course, there are some internal septations there is no peripheral edema as we expect in an in infection or in some more aggressive neopla neoplasia. Because of the hemosiderin, because of the bleeding, especially in the diffuse ones, which are the bigger, this hemosiderin has characteristics of low signal in all the sequences, which is a big characteristic of these injuries. And the GD, which is a contrast that we inject there, GD, it shows a very intense impregnation. In some cases, we see a diffuse case in this nodulation together in that uh, joint there. With this aspect, this nodular aspect in a more diffuse way. Here we have another localized injury T1, uh, intermediate or, or low signal, you know, is suggesting uh, uh, fibrosis, some, some fibrosis um, tissue showing that there is impregnation. So relatively, it's homogeneous. The localized shapes in big joint, knees, knees is a very frequent form not only the localized, but the diffuse form too. I'm going to show you some cases. The most common one is under there, you know, the patella 
this the injury there is in that subquadriceptal space over the patella. So you can see a low uh, signal there. There is an augmentation in the sequence T2. And here we have the axial uh, plan or angle showing the sequence T2. And the diffuse form, we will observe multiple nodulations that are extending in the whole joint um, cavity, showing some bone um, erosions. We see an injury that has this nodular configuration. And in the sequence, we observe the presence of uh, some uh, joint uh, bleeding in which we see a very low signal. It's a very dark injury, very dark, very black injury because of the deposit of hemosiderine, multiple nodulations that are extended throughout all the cavity, the joint cavity, and then low signal points to corresponding to hemosiderine. The US ultra ultrasound method. It's very used, especially in the extremities, and the indication is very precise. Even though the US shows the, uh, of course, the Doppler can show some circulation, some vessels, but it shows also the relation, the tendon and the joint, allowing you for a more dynamic examination showing the connection with the, 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 the injury, the joint, the tendon, it's very characteristic, but, but in, a, in a more uh, overall form, it's there. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't advance much, but it's a good, good exam, very good, very useful for people that, for doctors that are, um, experienced, it's low cost. Of course, the Doppler can be used to show the circulation too. I can remind you that the PET-CT for the giant cells tumor, the TCGT, it shows a captation of FDG and it can suggest a malign injury. For knees, for example, we have a localized, we have the diffuse form with multiple nodes with hemosiderin presence. And here it's in the suprapatellar in the half uh, fat together with the LCP. Some examples in this knee here, the infrapatellar uh, half fat and then there is a heterogeneous signal in the T2 sequence. Here we have yet another case with multiple internal nodulations within the uh, joint space or the articular space. And then we can see the injury in the T1 sequence after the contrast and the impregnation indicating that it's not other internal structures that are there, it's just showing. So the use of contrast is very, very key, very important in this kind of injuries. Another case, a total filling of the cavity showing the injuries, the expansive injuries there, very irregular, very heterogeneous, occupying all the joint uh, cavity. And then we have other inflammatory pathologies, which is really complicated. We have to think in synovitis by rheumatoid arthritis. We can think of synovitis for arthritis and so on and other chronic types. But what helps us is the presence of the hemosiderin deposits explaining that the TCGT is there before we call it uh, pigmented uh, synovlar synovitis. In this case, Dr. Becker case, it was an injury that was located in the anterior part of the ankle, but then actually it was extended to the other side. So it was a diffuse uh, injury. Sometimes 
it's intra-joint showing these bone erosions, which are very characteristic as I showed you um, in the other image. So it's an expansive mass localized in a more lateral form, which is not so common, but it can be extended, especially that it's located in, in a more lateral side. It's a more extended, it's a more, ex, uh, uh, it's a larger uh, injury and it's very specific, you know, the characteristics is very specific for TCGT. And then in Dr. Alexandre Avir, the patient was a woman with uh, injury on you know, her elbow. And then in the MRS, I mean, in the magnetic resonance, we could see that showed some heterogeneous aspects and the impregnation in the contrast, it showed it was a pigmented um, tenosynovial. So it's better now called tenosynovial giant cells tumor in a diffuse form. So now it's called TGCT and the bone erosions are present there. This is a very classic example. So it's a knee. We have many different diagnoses. We have the diffuse form. This case is very intriguing because we see multiple bone erosions, multiple nodular formations with a very low signal in the sequence T1 and T2 with a very dark, very black aspect with the, because of the deposit of the hemosiderine. Some uh, curiosities, this was called TCGT, but this tumor was next to the Achilles tendon and the Achilles tendon was, uh, Achilles tendon was there. And what happened is, because there was no tenosynovial uh, sheath. This was just a curiosity. Another differential diagnosis, diagnosis is we know that we have to use ganglionic cysts, glomic tumors, dermoid inclusion cysts, sarcoidosis, metastasis, sarcomas, gotosotophos, and others. So the glomic tumor, see the classic uh, position is there in the distal part. So it's brilliant in the T2, especially, but the clinic is, so what happens is the, the diagnosis can be done over the phone. I mean, seriously, but it can be considered the, as a differential diagnosis. The ganglionic cyst, the impregnation is always per peripheral, but it's characteristic. It happens next to the joint. But the important thing is that it's not showed by contrast because it's a cystic injury. Let's not forget the, our beloved Cyclops injury. But then the reconstructive sur uh, surgery shows that this nodulation even though it's heterogeneous, et cetera, et cetera, correspond to a um, scarring because of the, uh, uh, the surgery. This is interesting. It's a differential diagnosis. This case was sent to me by Dr. Aleixo and it's, uh, it's located in the finger but it's, the signal is very heterogeneous, very high in the sequence T2, but the location was very atypical. And then the doctor told me this injury is not TGCT. This is a fibrosis pseudo 
fibro uh, fibro pseudo tumor and some images showed low signal i thought it was hemosiderin but in reality this was bone it was a myositis another thing it didn't if we had paid attention this injury was not next to the tendon so it could not be TGCT. The sarcoma was very big, long lasting, big impregnation. This sarcoma was passed to me by Dr. Pedro Aleixo. We have a calcification of half a fat. It's a chondroma. But if we see the uh, MRI, I mean, we can think it was something else. We can think it's TGCT. Here we have a rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, there is not much hemosiderin in this case. The clinic, as Dr. Alexander says, and we hope that it's more important, you know, that will take us to do a differential diagnosis. Let's not forget the synoviosis sarcoma located next to the joints, next to the tendons, which was this case here. The plantar fibromatosis, it's a very classic and typical diagnosis. The neuroma is not next to the tendon, and this case came from Dr. Bruna from Curitiba showing a very expensive injury and the resonance showed this next to the fixers, fixators, a tendon elonged. The echography showed the injury, which was located not in the topography of the median um, nerve, but between the tumors. The surgeon showed that this was definitely a TGCT, synovial chondromatosis, and another case of uh, vilonodular synovitis or pigmented, diffuse, diffuse or located. It's hard for us to see or to know, but the characteristic here in the location is very characteristic. It's in the ankle. Take a look at this case, how this injury is very expensive, very big, and it's next to the metatars together with uh, the tendon sheets showing that it's synovitis, you know, vilonodular synovitis. That's now, it's called TGCT. This is a simple presentation with many examples, with many diagnoses, considering that we need to use uh, simple diagnosis. We need to use ultrasounds in big joints. We have to use, of course, the CT scan and the magnet resonance or endovenous contrast or if the conditions of the patient allows. Thank you so much. Thank you for your attention and time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Armando. Very interesting cases, definitely. You know, the, the diagnosis, uh, the differential diagnosis is always there. This is super important to show. I believe that um, I have one or two questions, but I'd like to ask Dr. Edgar if we have any questions in the chat, no, not yet, not yet, Ricardo, you can ask. Dr. Armando, it's very frequent for us, we work with tumors, right? It, that patient that came, you know, he went to a knee specialist, a knee orthopedic doctor, and then the, the patient had some uh, bleeding, uh, went to the ortho orthopedician, did uh, uh, an image there, and he got scared. Scared because it's there. The tenosynovial 
is there. What are the criteria that can help the orthopedist, the orthopedician, or people that work with knees in general for us to use the resonance in our favor? This suggests synovilodular, or this could be a, um, a self-immune disease, or this and that, hemophilia. You know, what elements can show, what characteristics can definitely show us that this is synovilodular? Well, the diffuse form, Dr. Becker, it's a big challenge, for sure, because even though we have elements they can show this differentiation, especially because of the deposit of hemosiderin. If it's an injury that it's recent with not chronic bleeding, and we don't have the deposit of hemosiderin, we, we, we won't have difficulties to see, to, to make the differentiation of a chronic synovitis that it's not villanodular, you know, because of the bleeding, or maybe we we'll see that it's villanodular synovitis. But when we see bleedings and bleeding and they become chronic, that deposit of hemosiderina in these nodes, we have to identify these small nodes because the hemosiderin it showing that, that it's bleeding a lot, especially in hemophilic uh, patients, you can have a deposit of hemosiderin around the, the capsule, you know, or this, the TZG, TZ, TGC tumor shows many different shapes be more preeminent in the cavity. But if you don't have these nodulations, or if they're very small and you can't identify the differences, so you have to see if there are nodes within the, the joints, you know, round, surrounded by hemosiderin. And then you can see if there is deposit of hemosiderin around the capsule, showing that it's a chronic bleeding you know, or for rheumatoid arthritis or tuberculosis. Uh, so I believe the element that really helps us is the nodular configuration and the presence of hemosiderin around the nodes. So you think that the acute disease is more difficult, right? When it's acute. Regarding the, the relapse, periprostatic prostatic relapse, the periprostatic peri relapse, especially in me, you know, there are some de degeneration and then the person who goes to prosthesis and there is a suspicious of relapse. It's hard, it is hard. If you put a pro prosthesis, knee prosthesis and it brings that brings so many art crafts that it it makes it difficult for us to identify the injuries i would suggest to do an orthotomography you know you inject contrast within that space where the prosthesis uh, allows and then you can suppress that metal and you can see the no nodular formations around the prosthesis, but with magnetic resonance is super hard because the material will show the presence of the, you know, the art craft. I've never had a situation like that, but if you do, I would suggest to do an orthotomo resonance. It's a CT scan with an intra-joint contrast with iodo, because then that uh, tomography will show a possible relapse. Every time we speak about invasive uh, 
procedures for people that have prostheses, it's hard, right? Because we, we get scared. Yeah, I would say so. We use that orthography for hip, hips processes. When I was in San Diego, California, we used that a lot for hip processes to see loosening and infection. We've never had complications, but of course we can be careful. We need to be careful. So I believe that uh, with all the, the, the care, we can do art tomography. Edgar, any questions in the chat? Yes, we have a question. Wagner is asking if you, if the colleagues do that before the resection, what's the degree of certainty when we have this injury with the impregnation of the fetina? In which point we could uh, forget about the biopsy? I got the question. I think the radiologist has a diagnosis hypothesis, but there is no absolute certainty. It, there is no guarantee that that is TGCT. We can say there are high probabilities for this and that, but you cannot super affirm, you know what I mean? Uh, this is radiology has limitations. We go to far uh, 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 probabilities, I mean, to important probabilities, even though we have all the characteristics of TGCT, but it depending on the size of the injury, then the doctor or the surgeon will decide if that will be a bi done biopsy or resection of the injury. Anything else that you got? We still have a question. Yeah. Eduardo Bervian, do you use echo sequences every time you have this suspicious? We should use, yes, echo reagent because this sequence is important to show the hemosiderin. A hemosiderin deposit is very characteristic of these injuries. Good, Becker. I think that's it. We've done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Armando. Thank you so much for uh, your presentation. If you can stay during the activity, we have two very important. Yeah, for sure. I'm staying. Definitely. Uh, it's a pleasure for me. Thank you, Dr. Armando. Thank you so much. So Dr. Eduardo Ortiz Cruz, he is a specialist in muscle esclectical tumors. He is uh, very important in the United States, Italy, Spain, for surgical treatments of sarcomas and esclectical muscle tumors. Thank you so much for your availability, Dr. Eduardo Ortiz. It's such a pleasure to have you here in our webinar. So you can please start your procedure with Thank you very much. I am I'm very happy to stay here. Thank you to Ricardo and Edgar to invite me. I will now to try to change my, my screen. I will see. That's okay? Yep. Okay, thank you very much. I am talking about surgery, oncology surgeons with a, with one second. Something wrong. Okay, I start now. Uh, what, what, what charge it? What's loading? The first thing is that we, we must to avoid problems. We are a surgeon, but we want to have a small tumor. We don't have a small tumor, it's a big problem. So we need to, to know 
where the, we want to have that tumor uh, very soon. First of all, this is a big problem. If you attribute the radiologic of clinical anormality to an eye process, you see this uh, soft tissue mass here, soft tissue mass here, like a Popeye, and now it is not like a Popeye, it's a big, big soft tissue mass, another soft tissue mass. All of these two was sarcoma, and this was rupture of the, ten, of the biceps tendon. Again, another one. This is a soft tissue mass, big soft tissue mass. This was a clear rupture of the muscle, and this was a sarcoma. Okay? This is very, very rare neoplasma. We need to avoid inappropriate or delayed treatment. If we are talking about surgery, we need a multidisciplinary surgical team. But all of these need a perfect working team for oncology, medical oncologists, the anatomopathologists, radiotherapists, ETC, ETC. Some of these are subestimated because we are thinking about other kinds of soft tissue sarcoma or, can, or soft tissue tumor. When we take it out and the pathologists call us, hey, Eduardo, you don't have an adjacent tumor of the tendon sheet. You have a sarcoma with a, all your marginal contaminated. It's a big problem. You see this case, 12 year old female, but very small, very small soft tissue mass, soft tissue mass of the foot. But looks at physitis, but then something wrong in the MRI and it's seen, but anyway, somebody take it out and that was a synovial sarcoma. So we need to make a wide resection and we, we need the help of our plastic surgeons. We need perfect strategy. First, the workup, all the, the, the imaging and physical exam, then biopsy, then, then staging, and then it's very important to follow the, 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 the protocols. If you don't follow the protocols, you are game over. I, I want to talk about biopsy. Two issues, two issues. This is a technical, simple procedure. What do you think? No, no, no. It's not a technical simple procedure. That is Henry Manti and Mario Capanacci laughing about that sentence. It's very difficult. The biopsy should be done after imaging studies and has to be performed in the final part of the all staging process. And the, the, the radiologist has to know exactly, well, more or less, when he has to put the biopsy because we need to resect that tract of the biopsy. We, in the all soft tissue mass, we met and by ultrasound, I, I, I want to put this here because it is in the bone. We, we use it with a CT in a, with an osteocut. And now, uh, uh, Ricardo invited me to talk about surgery. So we talk about surgery. This is all multidisciplinary team. But again, if you don't have multidisciplinary team, if you don't have plastic surgery, if you don't have vascular surgery, Again, I repeat, you are game over and you don't have to go inside that operating room. The incision has to be resected in all the piece. This is a percutaneous biopsy. This is incisional biopsy. But I recommend you this article for us. Sometimes you don't need to resect all that, uh, uh, all the tract. But academic issue, you need to resect that. The next size is what all the surgeons want. But the one that the, the, the patient is that one more than which. This is the idea. This is a mixed mixoid liposarcoma, huge. And after treatment, preoperative treatment is a very small, and we are ready to make a better surgery than before. We are talking about this. All we are talking now is too slight because sure, Dr. Martin Broto is talking better. Of this, the traditional issue is surgery, irradiation therapy, and sometimes chemotherapy. The new option is irradiation therapy, then surgery, and then sometimes chemotherapy. But you know, we prefer, and we are talking in the next slide, if we are able to make chemotherapy with irradiation, then surgery, and then sometimes irradiation therapy. This is a case. We are in the in, in, in the sarcoma conference uh, uh, with this. Big soft tissue mass, this is a sarcoma. We are talking all about sarcomas. 
and in, 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 in the committee, everybody say, Dr. Ortiz, are you able to receive this tumor, this mass, with a Y margin, R0? And I said, probably I will say a margin, and sometimes it will be R1. And, and I was, was thinking to have some treatment before. In this case, this, this man has chemo and radiation therapy concomitant, and you see how they reduce the tumor. We were able to reset with the, with the tract. We reset all the muscles, and, and this is very important. This is very important. This is part of the surgery. You have to bring the, 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 the tumor to the pathologist in order to show him the orientation, the conflicting margins, and to know where is, where is everything in this case, the anatomic situation. If you don't send this, this the, the pathologist has a big problem. And also, if, if you send it in a formal, the, the, the margin is reduced two or three millimeters, I think, for every five hours or something like that. And then he can say, this is positive. And we all know that it, we know that it's not positive margin. Pseudo capsule, be careful. When we have a sellout resection, some, somebody said, this is benign, and take it out. And you know, the benign tumor has capsule, the malignant tumor has pseudo capsule, and this pseudo capsule is plenty, plenty of biologist tumor, tumoral nodes. So if you, if you make this, you take it out, this is a positive margin and all contamination, okay? Surgical resection must be for performing according to the following criteria. The quality of the surgery will be defined by its worst margin. You can have a spectacular white margin, 99%, but if 1% of your piece is positive, that margin is R1. Be careful. It's very important that when you bring the, the, the mass to the pathologist, you show him, he put the, the, the ink at surface and to see in the, in, 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 in the, in the microscope when the, this is positive or no margin, okay? You have to have, try to avoid every positive margin in your surgery. There are some tumors that are free tumors, mixofibro sarcoma, UPE sarcoma, and layer sarcoma that you have to make a white, white margin because these tumors have tails, correct? Like this. Why, why, margin? No, they said, okay, very soon. No, no. You make a white margin. Why, why in these three tumors? Now we have to talk the most important issue of the, of the, of the, of the orthopedic oncology surgery. Barriers. We work with barriers. Perniostion, aponeurosis, fascia, pineal, adventitia. Correct? How we need an intact barrier, no matter what the white is. Correct. We could be one millimeter, like here, R0, one millimeter, one centimeter, but have to put anatomical barriers. The, the, the best issue is more than one centimeter. But if we, if we are talking about barriers, and also if we are talking with irradiation therapy before, we could be very close. R1 is marginal if you have one to one centimeter without anatomical barriers. How to get all of this margin with the, with the barriers? When they are close to the nerves, close to the vessels, close to the bone, close to adjacent skin. This is more or less the ex spectrum. And you need vascular surgeon and plastic, and plastic surgeon. Close to the nerves. We said that the, 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 the barriers is the epineuro. You see this big tumor, UPS. This is the epineuro here, and it is sciatic. I told you, it's very difficult to dissect all the epineuro. You have to read this article. Lily is publishing the literature. In the literature, he's the report from the Toronto group about the perineuro. This is a piece of amputation. I try to make in the piece of amputation to resect the epineuro. This is difficult, it's interrupted. However, we will try. But that is that we need the help. This is irradiation therapy before, it's a small reduction, and we were able to reset the tumor with a wide margin, R0, less than one centimeter because we have the bar. How about this? Close to bone, but close to skin, because it's not over, everything is easy. If you are close to skin, 
you have to reset the skin. If it's close to bone, I, again, you have to reset the periosteum or the bone. We will see, okay? In this case, we were able to reset the periosteum, we were able to reset the epineurum, and then we make a huge defect that is coming, the, 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 the plastic surgeon, and, and reconstruct all the defect. This is very important. When we are close to bone, we want to know if we are able to go for the barrier of the periosteum or to go to the old bone. Sometimes the periosteum is with very few tumor cells. An article for us that I recommend again. This case, I told you, this case that you're thinking, oh, this, why you do all of this and you don't know less? Sometimes I am very aggressive, I told you. And then our pathology reviewed the periosteum and the periosteum was with a, with a positive margin in the periosteum. You can read here, microscopic periosteal infiltration without bone involvement. Could be we can go intercalary resection. Anyway, how, what do you think about this case? All bone, all the diameter. I want to talk about that. This is the case. Periosteum, nice. Periosteum, nice. But you see, again, interrupting, this is a old man. Okay, here's a report. This is for Andy Anderson on periosteum. The way of, of the periosteum is sometimes now micro. Is that safe? That is the issue where we need to be careful with the periosteum. How about this case? This is the last week case. I made the periosteum resection, but the tumor was inviting the periosteum. So we have to reset the bone. Okay. In the, in the children, it's different. The periosteum is easy to make a, a nice, this is a piece of amputation. I want to show you again. It's very nice to reset the periosteum. Again, in our soft tissue sarcoma, we make the periosteum sweeping. Be careful with the pathology fracture after that. If it's making an irradiation therapy before, we always at two or three months, we put a fiber carbon NA in order to prevent the fracture. But sometimes, how about this case? That was the case here. We make a, 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 a resection. We put the, uh, the, 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 the patient half irradiation therapy uh, uh, before two years post-op, irradiation therapy post-op, looks like fracture in a, in a bone, ne necrotic bone. Fortunately, this lady has a, 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 an A. We have to think about that, the, 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 the treatment now. Again, another case, surrounding all the bone, periosteum. But this is very close to the uh, profundus femoral. How you make that? It's more easy to make a wide resection, taking the bone. And again, our, our pathology re review the, 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 the macro piece, and the periosteum was infiltrated by tumor. It, this is, was easy. Again, the same, all the periosteum we will see now in the, in, the X, in the MRI, perfect infiltration of the bone. It was easy to take the decision. It's close, you, you can make the, 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 put the prosthesis. In this joint sarcoma, intraspirated joint sarcoma, we make a resection and intercalary allograft. Then in this case, we make any cortical allograft because we see it's very difficult to, to resect here the periosteum. How about it's close to vessels? We have the adventitia. But if the patient has irradiation before, it could be that adventitia is not, not fine. But you could do. But you, I, I recommend you. If you are making the resection of adventitia, is better with a vascular surgery. The, the, every specialized in this century work very well. Example, the vascular surgery works perfectly with the vessel. Go to the vessel. But how about this case? Huge of tissue mass, host of tissue sarcoma, inside the bone, where are the vessels? We don't know, it's inside that. The, the sarcoma infiltrate or surround the vascular structure. Look at the Not surround it. It's inside the tumor. Absolutely inside. At this point, I recommend you, don't try to go little by little. It's easier to go directly, resect, make the bypass, the vascular made this fast, 
and you have a nice margin. When it's close to a ski, remember, in the, in the tumor is subcutaneous, your body, you don't have body, you have body in the, in the depth, that is the, the fascia, but you don't have body in the skin. You have to make resection of the skin, a huge resection, like this, correct? You take it out, go to the pathologist, show exactly the case, show you if, if, if the tumor has taste or not, it has a small taste here, and then resect it with latissimo dorsiflab, local latissimo dorsiflab. The take home message, number one, you think that you are, not, are, you are very nice surgeon, spectacular surgeon, but you don't have your multidisciplinary team together, don't go to, with this patient to make a surgical treatment. Send to, to the people that have a working sarcoma group. Always before biopsy. Remember, anatomical barriers, that's a six. You have to work with that. And always with teamwork. If you are not working with a teamwork, you have a big problem. I am finished with this, but I want to invite you, our BSTT tumor in, in Madrid again, for at last, we are two years be before it to be in vivo. It's in June 22. Also, Javier is coming. And thank you very much to listen to me. And I am ready for questions. Obrigado. Gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Thank you. It's been great, great. It, it, it raises lots of questions. This is a subject that every, every slide you show up, we have questions to do. No, it's a quite intriguing subject. Um, Edgar, do you have questions? I have to turn on, yeah. Do you wanna ask questions uh, or let me to start? I hope my English also understand. Do you understand my English or was very horrible? No, <laughs> it's awesome. It's great. Great. It's really easy <laughs> to understand. Yeah. Sometimes I don't understand by myself. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but okay. So, do you have do you have a pathologist in in an in intraoperative moment? Do you have uh, someone to check your your margins in during the surgical oh. procedure? Because there comes quite tough to do that. It's not interoperative, but it's very close. It's like a 50 meter from the OR. It's in the anatomic, in the path lab. And so we always take the piece uh, in our hands and we go to through him and we and the other student waiting in the operating room, waiting for the, for the phone call, the marginal suit or not. But always 100% of the big pieces, we bring the, the tumor to the pathologist. So do, do, you, do you have to change your decision during the surgical procedure because the opinion of the pathologist during yes. the procedure yes. or not? Is it, is it your routine? Yes. But we always told the patient in the informed consent that we, we because it's a preliminary, sometimes we made the ink and, 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 and made the intraoperatory for the conflictive margins because not the ink, but for example, I am very close and I think, oh, I don't know if there are something more there. I take uh, um, uh, intraoperative margin and, and we wait for that. But the patient know that we probably, at two weeks, if the pathologist said, hey, in, uh, you have a positive margin, we go again. If we are able to, to expand that margin, sometimes we are not able to expand. That is the committee decide if we need more irradiation therapy, we need the boost or not. That is very important. And what, what about uh, the fixation, the prophylactic fixation? Do you have criteria like uh, 15 centimeters of the periosteal removal, or do you always do that when it's close to bone? No, 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 always. It's like, a, uh, it's a good question. It's like, a, like a, no, we say like, a, uh, like a, our knowledge. We say that this 
for example, that K that is almost 108 nail all surrounded the bone, we know that this is almost fractured. Like a 50% of the diameter could be. This is very small now. Have you ever? Uh... Maybe, maybe, always, maybe in the femur. In the other wheel, I don't have experience in tibia and neither in the, in the humerus. Uh, do you have experience? And, all, again, and always, we, since five years ago, we start only with carbon fiber. The carbon fiber take the, the, change the life of the radiation therapy. No artifacts. They plan very well the, 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 the irradiation therapy because they like a, like a laser, because no artifact that they have a very good planification. And very important, it's not, expect, it's not more expensive than the titanium. It's more or less similar. Yeah, it's easier to control to control the recurrence. Yes, easier. Easy yeah. yeah, really good. So, how have you ever had success treating this uh, post necrotic um, non unions? <laughs> because almost all my patients. Uh, ah, good point. Good point. <laughs> I know that this lady is not consolidated. Probably this lady will need a prosthesis. I have two cases of that. In the proximal femur, I go directly to prosthesis because, well, not directly. One of them, I was vascular, uh, vascular fibula, uh, ICBG, anything, and never consolidate because it's a necrotic bone. Yeah, it's quite hard. I had two or three amputations uh, secondary to yeah, this kind of, because you could never treat them. And it's, it's quite hard to, to get success. It's um, and not frequent. It's uh, horrible, yeah. but not frequent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Edgar, any question? Uh, yeah, I have a, a question. Uh, Dr. Ortiz, when you mark your margins with ink after or during surgery, do you follow any protocol to uh, select which margin you mark with your ink? It? I, I mean, uh, no. do you have any uh, predilection to, to mark it? No, and the no, second it, question is about uh, cutting the species. Do you cut the species in during the, uh, uh, after surgery, but in the OP room, or just after you leave it, do you uh, take it to the pathologist? No, in the in the laboratory room in the path lab, we have the the the, the mass. We go to the pathologist. He looked the mass. We show him where is our conflict margin. Sometimes he put all black ink. Another time he, 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 he could be a little bit lost. If it's anterior or posterior, yeah, I, I, you see that tumor, he put two kind of, of colors. Then when he, he do that, he go to cut the tumor. But before ink, because he could before, he, 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 he could, and then ink, it's not, not worth it. You don't understand? Yes, okay. 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 That is okay. our protocol. Yeah, we saw there, there's a little bit uh, difficulty in, in, it's not every service that can uh, have this short time contact with the pathologist. That means that mm, sometimes the, patho the surgeon has to mark his a specimen of the, the resection and just some days or the next day the pathologist will see this this uh, specimen so uh, when the contact is not in the, at the same time it's normally um, I, I think it would be a good solution when you can ink it and mark and, and uh, explain exactly what did you ink in the in the specimen to after the, the pathologist can see this and can understand what's uh, superficial, what is uh, deep, what is uh, uh, caudal, what's cranial, and so he can understand the piece better. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure that all services can have this short time contact with the pathologist. That's the, why we were thinking about a solution, a protocol to ink the pieces, the the, the resection specimens. Yes. I think that's right, as like you said, but it's very important that hospital is working with tumors, has to be very close to the pathologist. It's very important. 
because if no, it's one of the piece of the old group is is failure, and then is you you crash. It's better to have the pathology you don't have. Your opinion is 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 is, is very, very very good. Also in the surgery, I have some tips. You remember the the, the, the how do you say Hansel y Gretel? Hansel y Gretel uh, writing that when Hansel y Gretel go to the to the forest, they put some very small stones to you know in order to get out if something happened. I when I I some I know in a conflict tip in conflict margins, I put more clips in that time. I put like a, I know where I were before I know probably that is the, 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 the big problem. I told the pathologist, look me this here, probably they said, this is negative intraoperative, but then in the uh, two we said, this is positive. I know where, where I was. Like Hansel y Gretel. That is a yeah. very nice, I told you. <laughs> Yeah. We have to invite nice some kind of Hansel y Gretel to symposium. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a good tip, Eduardo. Good tip to, to remove some uh, contaminated area where you have an R2 or R1. It's a good, quite, quite good idea. I haven't, yeah. I haven't used this before. Uh, yeah. Any other questions uh, from the audience? Uh, no, we have not. No. I guess I could spend a day asking questions to Eduardo here. Because this is a very interesting and, subject. And I, uh, I think now it's very important to listen Javier, because then it's the contact of the, co the of the of the multidisciplinary team, and then we can we'll have more questions. Sure, sure. sure. Uh, well, uh, I got, we're gonna start now with. Uh, thank you, Eduardo. Thank you very much for your for your lecture. Thank you. It is awesome. You. Some good, real good tips. Um, I'm gonna speak in Portuguese now. Just just a moment. I'd like to call Dr. Javier Martin Broto, our guest. He is a medical oncologist of the Fundacion Jimenez Diaz in Spain, University Hospital in Madrid, Spain. He has a very large uh, curriculum, but basically Dr. Javier Broto is working with a sarcoma in research treatment, but research is important. He is the leader of the multidisciplinary network of uh, Latin American and European countries to improve sarcoma and rare injuries uh, diagnosis. So Dr. Javier, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ricardo and Edgar. Uh, dear chairpersons, it's my pleasure to share this lecture along with my friends, uh, Eduardo Ortiz and also Armando Breu. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. So this is my disclosure. And I will go through these points in this lecture. And uh, obviously I will start with uh, the localized disease. And uh, as Eduardo mentioned, multidisciplinary team is essential in the decision-making process in, in the sarcoma patients. Many, many questions on the table we have to uh, decide uh, in one case, uh, so if it's resectable, uh, if it's operable, uh, what limb function will be left, uh, what is the risk of distant metastasis, what is the long-term effect of the treatments, and et cetera. So it's uh, very important because it's devastating if the patient is seen in a closed compartment because you will take decisions individually and it will be impossible uh, to obtain all the critical uh, information about margins, for instance, as uh, Eduardo mentioned, and other important uh, information derived uh, of this procedure in, in the diagnostic and therapeutic process. So instead, the patient should be the center and the uh, uh, different uh, physicians should uh, orbit uh, around the patient, around the case in the multidisciplinary sarcoma team. This is the only way to offer the best uh, option uh, for uh, local control and also for distal control. And uh, the central axis is the core biopsy. 
And this is uh, important because the, the diagnosis is, is very complex in the context of sarcoma. And this is extremely uh, difficult in some uh, cases. So peer review is recommended a lot of time. Um, and then uh, if we don't have a, an adequate diagnosis, we cannot offer an adequate uh, prognostic information and neither an adequate uh, treatment plan. So this is uh, uh, just illustrating two pole different uh, approaches in, in, the, in the upper side the, the case was a multi uh, was a, a MPNST, a very very easy, very uh, superficial tumor, but unfortunately, an intralesional uh, resection was done, and then the 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 consequence was uh, a local reg local regional extensive uh, uh, recurrence, impossible to cure, and uh, the the patient finally died. But in the in the lower um, in the lower imaging, we can see a synovial sarcoma in a 21-year-old 20, uh, female patient. Uh, uh, discussing a multidisciplinary team, uh, this tumor was involved in two compartments in the, in the fight. And after the discussion, uh, chemoradiation therapy was advised for neodivant, in neodivant setting, and a limb sparring surgery could be offered. So 10 years later, the, the, the patient is, is free of uh, recurrence. So these are uh, two different uh, approaches. And uh, this means that centralization is, is extremely important in, in sarcoma. If we want to increase the probability of survival, we need to refer patients to uh, expert centers. And uh, there are a plethora of publications demonstrating that. Uh, this is a... a recent publication in those centers with a, a highest adherence to clinical practice guidelines obtain better results, significantly better results than those centers that are not uh, with a good adherence or, or, or compliance to clinical practice guidelines for both for progression free survival and also for overall survival. So it's very, very important. What is the picture in, in Europe about the centralization? Is still, there is still left to improve because uh, there are major devi deviation from clinical practice guidelines in up to half of patients. In a 40% of uh, the diagnosis, uh, this uh, diagnosis is uh, modified after a second opinion by a sarcoma expert pathologist. And only one third of sarcoma patients is managed in accordance to clinical practice guidelines. And only half of patients receive an adequate surgical margin. So there is left to improve in, in our region as well. And this is also a picture uh, that's seen as the, the difference uh, of the outcome. If the patient with retroperitoneal sarcoma is treated in a spur center, or in a general hospital without any experience in retroperitoneal sarcoma. This is compared the transatlantic Asian Pacific uh, uh, retroperitoneal uh, working group versus the SEER um, statistics. So it, this was uh, significantly better if the patient was treated in this kind of expert centers. And this is overall survival. And uh, as I mentioned, a lot of publications focusing on the same centralization, expert multidisciplinary teams uh, entails a better outcome in uh, different uh, aims, different endpoints. Uh, and also in Spain, we, we made this uh, photograph uh, that uh, cover one decade ago, more or less, uh, and the same results. If the, if the patient was managed in sarcoma expert center, the probability of relapse free survival was significantly better in, in the somatic sarcomas. And also the uh, overall survival was better if the patient was managed in this reference center. So just to, to share with you that CELNET is a, a network of Latin American expert uh, centers in sarcoma. These are the official partners, but this is the associate, associated partners. This consortium is steadily, steadily uh, growing, steadily uh, soaring uh, um, over time. So it's, it's very, very good to work in a, in a network uh, faction. And uh, for sure, this will be important. And please uh, 
uh, enter in the in the network if you uh, have a good uh, multidisciplinary team. So focusing on on localized disease, these are the three main uh, pronostic factors. The great uh, we are using the most validated system, the French system. Uh, the tumor size and in less in less uh, manner the tumor depth. Uh, the grade is important. This is just a retrospective series, but this uh, indicates that only grade three is benefited by uh, a perioperative chemotherapy. We are usually saying that grade two is the same that grade three in terms of high grade tumors, but it's not the same. Uh, look at that in grade two no beneficial at all is observed in this uh, big retrospective series from French colleagues. So regarding the perioperative uh, second generation trials in uh, localized high risk uh, soft tissue sarcoma patients, uh, uh, I want to point out that the, the most important, one of the most important question is the uh, dose intensity. So using the two most active drugs, uh, anthracycline or apiribicin plus ephosphamide in the highest possible dose is important. And not only the, the good selection of patients, we are talking about the high risk. What it means exactly high risk? High risk means a deep location greater than five centimeters and grade three, or uh, talking about the, the circulator, the nomogram, we are talking a high risk if the risk of death by sarcoma is greater, is higher than 40%. So uh, several uh, comparative trials have uh, tested uh, several schemes, but the Italian sarcoma group scheme from Frustaci was the pioneer of a new, I, I mean, a new version because they selection uh, only high risk patient and selection and they selected the highest dose intensity for the most active drugs. So in the, in the interim analysis in this, in this trial, comparing uh, five cycles of epirubicin plus ephosphamide versus control, uh, the Independent Data Monitoring Committee uh, advised for uh, stopping the trial because of the difference. And the second trial uh, was performed just comparing three versus five cycles the three first cycles for both uh, arms were, uh, were done in a perioperative, in, in a neoadjuvant setting. In this occasion, the Spanish sarcoma group cooperate with uh, the Italian sarcoma group. And interestingly, both arms were super impossible. But the most important message was that these two, are, two curves uh, circulated in the same way than the previous treatment arm of the Frustaci, um, of the Frustaci trial. Uh, that means that the same selection of high-risk uh, soft tissue sarcoma and the same selection of the scheme entail the same results, which is very, very important. So the third trial uh, between Spanish uh, and Italian sarcoma group, and in this occasion, French sarcoma group also was incorporated, uh, looked for uh, compare uh, the uh, control arm of epirubicin plus ephosphamide versus different experimental treatments uh, according to five different histotypes. Uh, in the third interim analysis, the Independent Data Monitoring Committee advised for stopping the, the trial because the significant differences in both in relapse-free survival, survival and overall survival. The mature data say that the overall survival is still significantly better uh, favoring the uh, control arm, the epirubicin plus ephosphamide uh, uh, scheme. So for us, the, the standard of care in high-risk uh, population, in high-risk soft tissue sarcoma, is uh, three cycles, three courses of uh, neoadjuvant epirubicin plus ephosphamide. And as I mentioned, the nomogram is important in order to establish a most robust prediction uh, when, when a patient is in our office. So uh, it's important to use. Another Another uh, argument is planning uh, the, the relevance of perioperative chemotherapy in high risk uh, is this, uh, this uh, trial. This is an EORTC trial uh, comparing ad adriamycin plus ephosphamide uh, versus control arm. Uh, but in this occasion, no selection was done. 
and patients with intermediate or even low risk and high risk were uh, recruited. So it, the, the, the study was negative. And no differences were found between uh, perioperative chemotherapy or control arm. But if you are applying the nomogram, the circulator in this population of this ERTC trial, we can observe that in the high risk population, the red curves, those receiving chemotherapy significantly benefited, significantly showed a higher overall survival than those not receiving chemotherapy. So again, the, the message is it, how important is the selection of the patient and the selection of the uh, adequate dose intensity for the most uh, active drugs in a sarcoma. So moving on to the advanced disease, uh, what facts and aims we have in this, in this context? Uh, we know that higher probability of overall response rate and longer progression free survival in first line than in for the lines that we know also that polychemotherapy entails a higher overall response rate a longer pfs uh, compared to doctor we've seen alone uh, and unfortunately we uh, we know also that polychemotherapy entails no significant benefit in overall survival over doctor we've seen alone this is uh, exemplified by this uh, a randomized trial comparing uh, doxorubicin plus phosphamide versus doxorubicin alone, a significant benefit in terms of progression free survival, but this was not reached for overall survival. Uh, I wonder uh, just in, in leiomyosarcoma patients, if the scheme was doxorubicin plus dacarbacin, which is more, more active, maybe this curve of overall survival would be different, who knows? But again, uh, the doxorubicin is called the black widow because the partner in the, in the advanced disease usually died uh, later on. And this is the case for uh, evophosphamide, polyphosphamide, or laratumab, uh, which were uh, unable to demonstrate advantages in the, in the overall survival over uh, doxorubicin. But the combination it has a niche because sometimes uh, the uh, shrinkage is important to uh, concede a better uh, disease control or maybe to facilitate resection or to improve the symptomatic uh, uh, the, the symptoms of the patient. In the upper and uh, left side, we can see a patient, a very symptomatic patient with synovial sarcoma in the lung. And after one cycle of uh, pyruvicine plus phosphamide, uh, the patient uh, felt uh, pretty well, improved in the uh, short breathing. So, and you can see also the, the relevant uh, shrinkage of the, of the tumor. Another example in the upper right side, uh, this was also an synovial sarcoma involving two compartments, the perivent, the peri, um, the in abdominal and perivertebral, and it was impossible to, to resect in this condition. So after the polychemotherapy, the tumor shrank, and it was possible to make the sur surgical resection. And in the, in the lower uh, space, this high-grade nose sarcoma, after the polychemotherapy, the tumor reduced and the resection was possible. So in, even in, in locally advanced or metastatic uh, disease, we can uh, choose better the polychemotherapy in order to obtain or symptomatic, fast symptomatic relief, or maybe to facilitate the surgery. It's true that in most cases, doxorubicin is enough because mm, in most cases, for the first line I, I mentioned, in most cases, uh, just uh, the disease control is the most important uh, question. The patient will not be uh, resectable independently of the response and no symptoms are in, uh, currently, so the disease control is the aim. But sometimes uh, for first line, we don't choose uh, doxorubicin-based chemotherapy because uh, some specific subtypes uh, are resistant to anthracyclines and in general for chemotherapy. This is the case of solitary fibrous tumor or alveolar subpar sarcoma or extraskeletal myxoid chondrosarcoma or even pecoma or, or uh, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors, for instance. So in these specific tumors, other um, different uh, 
therapies are uh, advised. And maybe in myxoid liposarcoma, according to our uh, preliminary results, trabectidine maybe, maybe is enough uh, compared to doxorubicin and less toxic. This is uh, one randomized trial we have uh, closed. Uh, uh, so in the last year, so maybe the, the, the upcoming year will be mature. We will, we will be uh, with mature data to, to publish. And just in, in the headlines, um, in second lines, we have these uh, drugs um, after pivotal trials uh, and the approval of uh, regulatory agencies, pathopanib, trabectidine, and erivalin. And we have also uh, gencitabine combinations, uh, same from a uh, randomized phase two trial. And, uh, but uh, you can look at that the overall response rate, the probability of response is uh, less than 10% in, the, in this uh, re uh, register to uh, treatment for second lines. The, we, we don't have any trials uh, answering the question of what is the best sequence in second line. So the best sequence is based on several factors. One of the most important factors is the type or the subtype of sarcoma. And you can see, we can share the, the, the presentation for, for any of you if you are interested. But the question is, in second line, we have opportunity to offer a, a, some shrinkage, a attractive shrinkage for the patient in order to, as I mentioned in the first line, in order to uh, facilitate resection, even in second line, or maybe uh, in order to alleviate symptoms. So, so far we had only high dose ifosfumide for that and just restricted for synovial sarcoma and maybe for a uh, dead differentiated liposarcoma. Uh, but in recent times, we have also the combination of trabectidine plus radiation therapy. This is just one example that could uh, illustrate that. This was uh, a leiomyosarcoma in the shoulder with a local regional affection involvement and also in metastatic nodules. In that time, we uh, initiated with doxorubicin plus olanatumab. And after the first cycle, uh, an enlargement was, was seen. So we uh, recommended uh, the combination of trabectidine plus radiation therapy. Uh, we know that uh, by the TRUST trial that Trabectin is, is very synergistic. And this was the reduction after uh, some uh, cycles. The radiation therapy is done just uh, concomitant to the first cycle. And uh, this is the picture of the, of the tumor. The, the tumor became uh, in, infected after the necrosis uh, in, due to the treatment. And... Uh, also, another, another example of synovial sarcoma treated even in a in metastatic setting with the combination of trabectidine plus low dose of radiation therapy, 30 grays, three grays per day, 10 fractions. So another example uh, in, the, in the upper right and in the lower side as well. So we have uh, published the, the phase one, two trial uh, with this combination and the shrinkage percentage was extremely positive, extremely powerful. So this is an option for a shrinkage uh, with high probability. In, in fact, in this trial, according to Central Radiological Review, there were there were sixty percent of uh, responses uh, in this in these patients. But it's it's true in some cases uh, that this is control is enough. Is, is the aim, the main uh, endpoint, because the patient is not uh, symptomatic or maybe the resection is not in the horizon. Just uh, to know that there are several uh, other types, the immunomodulation in sarcoma uh, is, is not a very good option in general, but it's true that in some specific subtypes as alveolar subpart sarcoma is very uh, important. And also the uh, TCRT cell therapy, the cellular therapy is a pioneer in sarcoma. And these are the, so far the, the two neantigens for which we are uh, directed the, the, the immunomodulation therapy. And it's also working in some instances, it's under trial, but it's a promising, a promising um, uh, therapeutic option. Uh, 
for anyone ny so one or for mh4 and uh, there are some new compounds that maybe is uh, out of the scope of the trial but just out of this event tacemetostat abemaciclib selinexor and napsirolimus each one with a specific uh, indications. Spexidartinib is anti-CSF1 inhibitor in, in very powerful in, in the context of tenosynovial giant cell tumors. Now there are other new compounds arriving in, in new uh, trials. So if uh, you have patients uh, with a diffused form of this, uh, of this entity, uh, you can refer to us because we will have anti-CSF1 in the clinical trials. So rafenib is also interesting in the context of desmoid and selometinib in the context of neurofibroma, for instance. Uh, of, of course, NTRAC uh, sarcomas are extremely rare, but uh, there, are, there is a specific drug, uh, very, very active. And uh, there are uh, a plethora of uh, different sarcomas with uh, increasing a number of uh, targeted therapy. And it's very, very complex to uh, talk about uh, many, many uh, subtypes. So the conclusions are different aims could involve different therapeutic strategies in first line uh, of advance of the sarcoma in clinical practice. The therapeutic aim has not been adequately addressed in clinical trials, is it true, in advanced soft sarcoma? The first line is antracycline based uh, with a phosphamide or the carbacin in the case of lyomyl sarcoma. In second line, there is no opportunity for a shrinkage with trabectinin and low dose of radiation therapy, apart from a, a high dose of phosphamide in the context of synovial sarcoma. And some specific sarcoma subtypes have a benefit from a targeted therapy. So thank you very much, Obrigado, for your kind invitation and for your uh, attention. Thank you. This is a, thank you, thank you, Javier. Uh, this is a awesome talk and heavy for orthopedists, but extremely interesting, the steps accordingly uh, to the staging of the patient, the situation of the patient. So, uh, Edgar, do you have questions from the audience? No, still not. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you some things. Uh, uh, Eduardo, if you have some questions before uh, Dr. Javier, please, you, you can, oh, I know you get used to talk to him <laughs> frequently, so. Uh, Javier, I have some, some, some specific questions uh, about the uh, soft tissue sarcomas. Um, the first thing actually is a more, uh, it's a question of orientation. Um, could you explain uh, how this, the cell net uh, group works i mean i, I want to i want to explain to the our audience of orthopedists could be interested in uh, participate of that yeah yeah absolutely uh, so that is a, just is a, for now it's a program it's a it's a consortium uh, supported by european program but uh, uh, according to the 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 response of different uh, centers i think this will be beyond this uh, this consortium will go beyond the four year um, program of uh, horizon 2020 which is the the grant supporting this this building this new building so uh, the the aim of this uh, consortium is is networking in sarcoma as a model of uh, ray disease and this entail uh, the identification of uh, reference centers and we have worked for for instance for defining um, uh, clinical practice guidelines so in each country these uh, clinical practice guidelines should be um, adapted and approved so I, um, we are offering now a peer review in uh, with a expert pathologist in Europe and uh, in Latin America we are offering also a multidisciplinary committee, uh, uh, mostly based. We are offering also uh, a registry that you can uh, um, register your cases. And this registry is yours. Uh, this could fit the, the general registry, but it's yours. And it's, maybe it's just for you. 
And uh, also we are uh, investigating, we are um, performing a translational research in several sarcoma subtypes because the, uh, the only way to advance is joining uh, rare sarcomas and investigating uh, in observational studies, but also in translational research and also in clinical trials, it's our aim. So uh, we are uh, growing, uh, steadily growing, and uh, our desire is to identify all the uh, important centers in each country in Latin America. There are more than, actually, there are more than uh, 40, almost 50 centers or institutions uh, belonging to, to CELNET. Uh, and I think this, this is very, very good news because um, I, I think uh, there is no more stimulating uh, that working together, to work together. And this is an opportunity to growth uh, and to plan uh, proposals and just to, to measure our activities also important. So uh, the tools are uh, at disposition of, of all centers and uh, also the, the networking. So I think it's, it's very, very enthusiastic and very good opportunity to join it, to grow uh, together in this uh, consortium. There's a, I think there are four or five centers in Brazil that are participating yeah. now. I want to update people who are watching this. So it's not something that is feasible to, to be part. I think it's a good, good oh, great absolutely. idea. Um, absolutely. We were talking before the lectures about the, the option of treatment for, for high risk uh, sarco soft tissue sarcomas. And Eduardo was talking about the, the possibility of uh, radiation plus chemo. So you presented this in this uh, lecture. So how, how do you deal with the toxicity of radiation plus a chemo, mainly yeah. anthracyclines plus IFO, for example, phosphamide that are extremely toxic? Yeah, it's a very good point, Ricardo. In the second trial, comparing three cycles versus five cycles uh, uh, we performed with the Italian Sacoma group, the three the first cycles uh, were done in a neoadjuvant sitting for both uh, arms. And in that trial, uh, we treated uh, around uh, almost uh, 400 patients uh, with high risk localized soft tissue sarcoma. And the radiation therapy was integrated in the neoadjuvant setting. So uh, our experience was extremely good. Uh, it's true that in that case, the recommendations were was to um, to make two splits of radiation therapy of 22 grays between cycles, between first and second and second and third, mm -hmm. and uh, just sparing one at least one day between the first of uh, chemo administration and the initiation of radiation therapy. For this very, very uh, restricted uh, um, administration, the, the patients should be admitted to the hospital in the weekend. Uh, to 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 give the chemotherapy, but in this in the following in the following uh, trial we relaxed this uh, very restrictive uh, uh, protocol, and, and also uh, it was free the, the administration of radiation therapy in a neoadjuvant or in the adjuvant setting. But again, the experience was very very um, nice. It's true that some uh, uh, some dermic skin toxicity is seen. But if you spare at least one, one day between the initiation, uh, between the, the end of chemotherapy and the initiation of radiation therapy is, is pretty safe and uh, no too much toxicity is seen. And in any case, uh, yeah, the, the plastic surgeons <laughs> don't, don't want to, uh, to enter in an irradiated uh, tissue because it's more difficult for the the musculo uh, the, the graft, uh, but now in in our experience it has been very 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 good. Um, some uh, is true. Some uh, delays in the in the uh, in the surgical injury uh, surgical wound, but. Um, Otherwise, it's, it's, it's very, very good uh, integrated. So for us, in our centers, we prefer the combination, the integration of chemoradiation therapy before 
surgery as much as possible with 44 grays is not more than 44 grays and this is the our protocol and the, the the number of patients enrolled in the third study between Italy, France, and Spain was almost was more than five hundred. So, no uh, big difficulties in in this regard. And then actually, uh, this will be a focus on a specific uh, manuscript. But so far, is um, is a good experience. Uh, the the number of amputations in these cases in the High risk uh, it was uh, less than five percent of cases, so it's it's very good uh, percentage as well. But uh, in in advanced setting, it's also uh, advice for radiation therapy. I don't know, Eduardo, in in La Paz Hospital is is using most uh, adjuvant uh, radiation therapy, or you are muted. Sorry. In La Paz, also in MD Anderson, we will always neoadjuvant with the radiation therapy when we need it. And maybe and we try to it is a big, as you see in the in, the, in some of the photos, we, we try to make a after the the, 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 the treatment with radiation therapy, um, no skin graft, always muscle transfer. Could be local or microsurgery. Because it's like that, it's, it's gone, like a, like a bone. Uh, Eduardo, uh, don't you see that you have more uh, problems in terms of healing as well as, because if you are integrating, and I'm not talking about just radiotherapy, I'm, I'm talking about chemo plus radiotherapy. This is something, uh, uh, it's a concern I've got. That uh, Two things, one, maybe the delayed time of the surgical procedure, you know, sometimes we would you, you usually wait four weeks after yes. ending radiotherapy. So, but you ha if you have added chemotherapy, don't you have to wait more? And second, second thing, don't you have more complications in surgical site after chemo plus radiation? Because radiation is something okay. I, we do that same thing, but plus chemo, it's something that I have to learn about it. We we, we don't have more complications. I think almost the same, and I. As I mentioned it, we, we like to, when we need the plastic surgeon, he came with a big, big uh, flap, with a big flaps. Mm -hmm. and, and, do you and also it's you? important to, man, we use the, I don't know how do you say, the pico? I don't know mm -hmm. how to name the, the, for the skin, for the wound, for the wound, is a back, but it's not, you know, the back, the, it's, you know, very small for this, I don't know the name, it's a back wound, something to put in the like a uh, in the in the in the in the wound we use that also and we don't take it out the the the, the drainage the red one after it's the when it's less than 30 centimeters in 24 hours we take it out if it's a little bit more we stay with that and no problem we said until it's less than 30. this is important because sometimes we, they have a big seroma Mix around, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, I just would like to, to ask you do you think you have done more uh, flaps than in the beginning or 10 years ago yes. when you didn't uh, have the radiotherapy before surgery? Do you think that these flaps are uh, <clears throat> making the, the, the surgery safer? Yes, yes. Because I love when the when the, the, the plastic surgeon told us, take whatever you want, don't don't save. If you need to take out ten centimeters, forty centimeters, we take out. And he said, I take care of to close that that that, that big defect, and that make us like as, like a surgeon, very peaceful in the in, in the OR to have a nice margin. But if, if we don't have the plastic surgeon behind us. We probably go very close in order to to close the skin, but if we have the the plastic surgeon, we are very That's right. uh, very peaceful. I don't know how do you say yeah. Yeah, yeah. very like, confident. Yeah, that is confident. That is very important, and the plastic surgeon has to be in the committee, has to be very active in the in the in, in the treatment of these cases, very active. 
Yeah, I, I have to say that uh, we are using the combination in a concurrent fashion, not in, ah. in the sequence fashion. I mean, it, the, the time of neoadjuvant treatment is not longer by the fact of giving both chemotherapy and radiation therapy, okay? Because uh, it is more or less is the same time. Is not uh, is not given in a sequential way, but in the concurrent way. Exactly. Just sparring, sparring uh, the fact that do, do not use at the same days uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy as much as possible. You you should spare one day uh, between both, uh, but with this uh, is is perfectly uh, able to to give in a in a adequate timing. Yeah. Yeah. This is a key issue, very important issue. Um, Edgar, any more questions? Do you have something to ask Dr. Armando? Questions? No, no yes, just, not very, very, just to, to say a comment, uh, impressive the, the imaging uh, that Armando shared with us in his lecture. And I think uh, it's important to know that the, biologically we know more about the tenosynovial giant cell tumors, and know the anti -CS CSF one is is a critical drug that can help in the in the diffuse forms of this entity. And fortunately, in Europe, the EMA, the agents agency, has not approved the pexidartinib in the use of this uh, uh, disease. Uh, but in in FDA is is uh, has approved the, the reason was uh, some liver toxicity, uh, but in our experience was a very 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 good uh, compound and in the patient uh, uh, the, the change was dramatic uh, in in terms of uh, the disease control but in terms of symptomatic relief and just new compounds are uh, emerging now under clinical trial. And I think this is very important because as Armando showed us uh, in a later stages of the disease, the, the impact of the surrounding bone is, is incredible. It's er erosing the bone and this um, devastating uh, disease. So this could be helpful. Yeah. Uh, it's been, it's been uh, giant cell tumor, tenosynovial giant cell tumor has been a big problem without drugs that could help us. Uh, we're, we look forward to having this uh, pexinartinib next year, maybe. We don't really know we have the same problem here in Brazil. It's not approved by Anvisa. It is our regulatory agency. Ne neither in Spain, neither in Spain. But in the meanwhile, there are clinical trials or a imatinib. Imatinib is another option. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. less powerful than pexidartinib. But yeah. So uh, if we don't have more questions from the audience or from colleagues here, we, then because of the advanced time, I want to say thank you for the colleagues, Dr. Eduardo, Dr. Armando, Dr. Javier, Edgar. Thank you very much, all of you. I, I hope to see you hey, soon. Let's take a picture. I want to take a picture. Sure. Please smile, everybody. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank technology. You. This is technology. <laughs> thank you, all of thank you. you I hope to see you. I would like to thank you to, to, to Javier, to Eduardo. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. a nice day. Look, I remember it too. It was very good. Really very good. Ciao, everybody. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Ciao. 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 Gracias. Bye -bye. Ciao, ciao. ciao.